Hey everyone, welcome back. This is gonna be the final video in my series about the financial statements. In this video, we will pull everything together that we have discussed in the first three videos and build a DCF from scratch. If you have not watched those first three videos, let me quickly recap what we discussed and I'll link to those videos if you want to watch them. In the first video, we talked about the income statement and some key trends and ratios to keep in mind, such as gross margin. In the second video, we covered the balance sheet where we drove home the importance of working capital and net debt. And then in the third video, we discussed the statement of cash flows and highlighted some key things to look out for in relationship to depreciation and capex. Now in this video, we're gonna talk about all of those items and pull it together into a DCF that we will build for Apple. If you're new around here, I wanted to quickly point out that you can follow along to any of my valuation videos. All you need to do is scroll down to the description and there will be a link for the model. You will need to make a copy of this model, but that will then grant you edit access so you can follow along and adjust my assumptions as needed. The first thing we need to do is cover the historical financial data for Apple. I will copy over the income statement, balance sheet, and then depreciation, stock-based compensation, and acquisitions of property, plant, and equipment into our model. I like to pull five years worth of data at a minimum this data is all available on the SEC website, which I actually covered in part one of this series. I'll quickly pull up their most recent 10K to show you exactly what we are copying over. Apple's financial statements are located in section eight of their 10K filing. So let's hop down into that section. And first we'll start with the income statement. You can see I've copied this over almost line by line. I've ignored product and service revenue for now and just copied over the total revenue and did the same for cost of goods sold. We're going to pull in a more detailed revenue schedule that they report as well, so I don't need to break it out here. I also list SG&A before R&D as that's just how I historically copy over financials. So don't let that throw you off if you're looking to replicate what I'm doing. There's no actual reason for me doing this other than preference. And that's just how I have always built out my income statement for financial modeling. For the balance sheet, it's gonna line up item for item. Something to note, if you go far enough back for some companies, the line items they report will actually change. In this case, you can either add those new items in and leave them as zeros for the future years where there's no value, or they do not report it. Or you can take the easier path and just layer it into the other area for assets and liabilities. Apple isn't the best example of this as they've actually kept their income statement and balance sheet pretty similar from a reporting standpoint for the last five years. But if we actually jump all the way back to 2014 and their 10K, we actually see on their income statement, they don't break out revenue here by product and services like they do today. In addition, on their balance sheet, you'll actually see they have a deferred tax asset under their current assets. If I were to see something like this for 2018, for example, I would just take that amount and add it to the other current assets line item to keep things simple. The next thing to copy over into our file is the depreciation and amortization, stock-based compensation, and acquisition of property, plant, and equipment, aka CapEx. This is gonna come from the statement of cash flows. And I will actually just add these three items alone. I capture this actually on my income statement tab in my model. No reason for this other than preference. You could create an entire separate tab within your model, but being it's only three line items, I don't wanna have an entire tab just for that. So now that we have all of this copied over, we wanna a copy over their revenue schedule. Just about every company will report this. It will live in the notes to consolidated financial statements, which will almost always immediately follow their financial statements in their 10K. For Apple, we can see they have a nice long explanation about where they talk, where they talk about revenue and all things to consider that, and then they provide a nice little table for us showing their revenue by product line. We will copy this over. I will put this on the same tab as the income statement, just below where I put the statement of cash flow item accounts. The total revenue here should tie out to what they report on their income statement as well. And we see that holds true. They break their $383 billion of revenue out by iPhone, Mac, iPad, wearables, home, accessories, and services. The reason we wanna break it out is the more detail, the better and it will allow us to make better projections into the future and also help with Cox cost of goods sold. Sometimes we'll get a similar table for cost of goods sold, but Apple doesn't appear to actually provide that. So in this case, we're actually gonna jump back up to their income statement and pull down the cost of goods sold split by products and revenues, which will be a good enough proxy for us. And we're gonna layer this in just below the revenue schedule on the income statement. So let's zoom out for one second and look at the entire income statement. On this tab, it starts with their income statement, then their statement of cash flows, then the revenue schedule we just looked at, 
followed by their cost of goods sold schedule split between products and services. So now that we have all this information copied over, we can actually update our base template for a DCF. So let's hop over to the DCF blank tab and let me first walk us through what we are actually doing on this tab and what we're looking at before we make adjustments for our Apple model. I've highlighted everything in yellow that will eventually need to be linked in and we will get to that in a minute. But this model is broken into two main sections. The top one is labeled as cash flow. We start with revenue, subtract our cost of goods sold, remove our SG&A and R&D expenses, which excludes depreciation and amortization. So you can see we're subtracting that out. And this will get us our EBITDA, also known as earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. From here, we will calculate taxes. To do this, we will subtract depreciation to get our EBIT, also known as earnings before interest and taxes. And now we calculate taxes based on EBIT to get an adjusted EBIT or earnings before interest. And then we add back our depreciation as is non-cash, subtract our CapEx purchases as they are cash, and then add or subtract working capital depending on if it has increased or decreased year over year. So that might have sounded like a lot of gibberish. So high level, what we're doing here is we are taking revenue then adjusting for any cash and non-cash expenses to calculate an unlevered free cash flow. What this means is it's the cash flow for the business unrelated to the capital structure. If a firm has a lot of debt with interest payments, and debt repayment, that would not be reflected in this number. The reason we do this is we actually wanna calculate the entire enterprise value, which would in theory ignore debt as enterprise value is the value to purchase the entirety of the firm, including debt. So that's the first section. It's the basis for our model. We go from top line revenue to cash flow. These will ultimately be used to calculate the firm's enterprise value, as I just mentioned. Now the section, the next section is our assumptions and it's exactly that. The assumptions we will use to model out our cash flows, everything from revenue growth to working capital. Lastly, there is a table off to the right that will compute the enterprise value after we fill in the model. We will ignore that for now and circle back to it later on. Now for Apple, I actually wanna do one more thing and that is to link in their revenue schedule and cost of goods sold schedule as well. So we can have a more refined assumption section. So let's go ahead and layer that into the bottom below this. So now there's gonna be two more sections added below that you can actually see here. One for revenue and one for cost of goods sold. This will hold all of our assumptions. Now let's link everything up. We will start in the cash flow section and work our way down. We'll be linking back to the data that we've actually copied over onto the income and balance sheet tabs of this file. I've highlighted in yellow everything that is linked out to a different sheet or pulled from the internet. In our working capital section, we need to link back to all current assets and current liabilities, excluding the debt and cash. So for current assets, I'm actually linking in the sum of accounts receivable, vendor non-trade receivables, inventories, and prepaid expenses. For current liabilities, I've linked to accounts receivable, and other current liabilities. The last thing to note here is in the cost of goods sold schedule, we've added to the bottom, I've linked in COGS as a percentage of revenue, but broken it up by product and service revenue based on how they report revenue. So for products, it's the product COGS divided by the revenue for iPhone, Mac, iPad, wearables, home, and accessories. And for services, it's the service COGS as a percentage of revenue of the service revenue. A quick note, you'll see now that we've actually added in the data in a lot of formulas are calculating in our assumption section. So now we're gonna move on to the last part, which is where we layer in our assumptions. This is really the make or break it part of evaluation. I've highlighted in purple the assumptions that we actually need to make. I tend to be a lot more conservative than most other people when it comes to modeling. I get a lot of pushback, especially on my Tesla videos, for example. Common commenters will state, what about RoboTaxi? What about their robot fleet? What about full self-driving? They're a software company, things like that. And you know, maybe one of those things will pan out, but I can't value a company on significant future speculation. So I tend to ignore a lot of the what ifs and stick to what is currently happening with the company. I will walk through how I think about Apple. I'll start with revenue. So we need to put in our revenue growth assumptions by product line. This is more art than science. You could make a more sophisticated model, for example, where maybe you looked at iPhone install base, annual market share, new markets, et cetera. But in reality, it's gonna be a lot of assumptions. And honestly, the more assumptions, the less accurate we tend to be. So for all of their core product lines, I'm gonna look at how the previous year trended, contextualize those based off current economic environment, and then extrapolate from there. So we can see all of their products are actually down year over year in 2023. We know inflation is high and that the lower and middle class consumer is hurting. So that probably plays into this. You would delay your phone upgrade. And honestly, this will probably continue through 2026 when interest rates are expected to come down 
and the economy is expected to recover a little bit more. So I'll have them being flat for 2024 and 2025, and then going to a marginal growth from there. I'm thinking maybe I have them jump in 2026 to a high single digit growth, then from there regress to around 3%. I tend to use three to 5% as a long-term growth rate for most firms as it's our sort of steady state growth where you can sell roughly the same level of products each year with a nominal price increase for inflation to get that 3% growth. Services, this actually appears to have been growing around 15 to 20% before decreasing to around 9% most recently. I would anticipate that they can probably maintain that 10% growth through 2026, see a slight uptick when the economy recovers, and then start to trend down in aggregate to see where these growth assumptions have a very modest level of growth. So for Apple revenue in total, this gives us a low growth of 2% to a high of 9.5% before trailing off to 3%. This takes revenues from 380 billion to 615 billion in a decade. This may actually be aggressive as they have such a high base already, but it actually does feel pretty conservative, all things considered. Now let's jump over to COGS. I'll usually keep this flat to whatever the last year was. For some firms, if revenue is shifting a lot to a business line with better margins, you could actually have it slowly decrease. And that may be what happens in aggregate actually here for Apple as well. As revenue shifts more towards services, we can see that if we keep COGS as a percentage of revenue flat to the 2023 levels for products and services, just having more service revenue in a decade has actually improved their overall margin profile by 2.4% or 240 basis points. Now let's update our assumptions for SGNA. I'm probably gonna hold this flat to 2023 levels of 7% of revenue. In a growing firm, we would expect this to decrease over time. But Apple is a large and relatively stable firm, so no big adjustments needed. R&D is similar. We need to hold it flat to 2023 as they're a mature, stable firm. If the company is in growth mode, this number could actually increase as a percentage of revenue for a few years before it comes down once revenue starts to pick up. Depending on how fast revenue grows, it could also drop if you keep it constant in absolute dollars. But I think firms should scale R&D with revenue as a percentage. Tax rate, I'll usually plug in the current federal rate for corporations, which today is 21% in the US. Historically, Apple's actually been closer to 15% on their EBIT, probably because of foreign operations, but I like to be conservative, as I said, so I'll hold it to the federal rate of 21%. So now onto CapEx, this is usually kept flat. If it's seen a big drop in recent years, I will tend to bump it back up. But for a mature firm, being around three to 5% is okay with me. Appreciation should come down to around 85% over time. I cover this in part two or three. Um, so as long as revenue is growing and you actually hold CapEx flat as a percentage of that, then depreciation would come down as CapEx is increasing. Um, so with all else constant, the split would adjust downwards. It should come down in a similar proportion to revenue growth, maybe slightly slower. So I usually model that in and then anchor it to about 85% once we hit kind of a steady state environment. The last assumption is our working capital. I don't like to assume a company will generate significant cash flows from working capital as it's not always in their control. So I believe it's best practice to set it equal to the previous year's level. We model it as a percentage of revenue for current assets and current liabilities. By keeping this flat each year, we're in a sense gonna neutralize any wild swings from cash flows for the most part, unless if there's a large jump in revenue. So now that this part's done, we just need to actually sensitize the data. So looking at our valuation table on the right side, we see that the nice little chart for WAC and perpetuity growth, that is blank. Unfortunately, if you're using Google Sheets, you can't set this up as a data table, but in Excel you can. So if you open up Excel to complete this, you'd actually highlight the table, go to the data tab, then select the what if analysis, and then select data table. In the row input, we put the terminal growth rate cell, and then in the column input, we put it the weighted average cost of capital. And then we're gonna hit okay. This will now update our table and we can see our valuation range from $1 trillion to $2 trillion. Apple is currently trading at $3.5 trillion. So this means the market is definitely anticipating Apple to have significant growth in the years to come. If you're very bullish on their future product offerings, then you could actually adjust our model to add in high revenue growth, maybe some cost cutting, things like that to see what the market is actually pricing in. And one last thing I wanna note here is the weighted average cost of capital it's essentially going to be your expected return on investment. It's the rate you discount the cash flows at. So it's what rate you need to be comfortable in the investment. So at a 10% return, we would only actually value Apple between 1.3 and 1.4 trillion. While at an 8% return, we'd value them between 1.8 and 2.1 trillion. So it really depends what your internal hurdle rate is for investments. There's a lot of videos out there, even ones that I've made in the past, where you can actually calculate a firm's WAC from an academic standpoint 
point, but it's just that it's an academic exercise. I feel like focusing in on 10%, and if a firm is undervalued at 10% whack with a conservative model, then I actually feel pretty confident that it could be a good investment in that situation. But anyways, that's all I had for today. That's how I pulled together a model. I'd encourage all of you to download the spreadsheet, poke around, see if it all makes sense, see if it makes sense to you, change my assumptions. And honestly, once you build this out 10 times for different firms, it gets super easy. So anyways, thanks so much for watching. Let me know if you have any questions below and see you next time.